Hello and welcome to IG's podcast series, Trading the Markets. Coming up, we're going to discuss the lessons that can be learnt from Canada's cannabis legalisation journey. Former CEO of Canopy Growth, Bruce Linton, shares the latest developments in the industry. Where Canada is, is now approaching the second generation of its regulation. So in January, you're going to see quite an increase in the types of products, beverages, vapes, edibles, available legally. They're not currently. It's principally dried cannabis and some oils currently. When those come out, uh, those products will be more interesting, a little easier to brand. And George McBride from Hanway Associates spoke about the shifting attitudes towards cannabis. What we see with cannabis around the world as well is that the, the politicians and the establishment and major institutions are much slower to change their attitudes towards cannabis than the public are. We can see that here in the UK where a far higher percentage of the public support cannabis legalisation than parliamentarians do. To find out more, stay tuned to our podcast, IG Trading the Markets. Around the table today, we're here to talk about investing in the relatively nascent cannabis industry, and in particular, the lessons that can be learned from Canada. There's no doubt the nation has been a real trailblazer when it comes to the growing industry. Canada became the first major Western country to legalise the drug for recreational use in October of 2018 via the Cannabis Act. Medicinal cannabis had already been legal there since 2001. It became the second country to have a legal marijuana market place only after Uruguay alongside 11 US states. And we're here to learn a little bit more about the Canadian experience, the journey to legalisation, some of the pitfalls and teething problems, and the next phase of its expansion. Plus, which countries are likely to follow in Canada's footsteps. So joining me today, I'm pleased to say, is Bruce Linton, the former CEO at Canopy Growth, and George McBride, the CEO at Hanway Associates. I want to to start with um, a bit about the history. Um, how did you first kind of get involved in the cannabis industry and how has it changed from then to now? So I started uh, in the cannabis industry in uh, early, mid-2015. Mm-hmm. I was working at an organisation called the Beckley uh, Foundation, which is Uh, a research institute in the UK which was working to look at the medical applications of a range of different illicit substances so LSD, magic mushrooms and cannabis Mm. Um, they then were in discussions with uh, Canopy Growth which um, obviously now is the largest publicly listed cannabis company in the world and so I I joined them as a policy officer using my, my experience as a lawyer to look at some of the quite complex legal issues around researching medical cannabis and other drugs in the UK. Had the privilege of meeting everyone in Canada when this was all starting to get very exciting in 2015. Previously, obviously, the industry had been just the black market. And now, in 2015, it was the first time people were being able to raise significant sums of money legally uh, for this industry. So obviously you've been to Canada quite a few times between then and now. Tell us how it's changed. Uh, Dramatically. So it's difficult for Europeans who who haven't travelled much in North America to understand the experience. Like there has been uh, black market, uh, but um, very conspicuous cannabis retail in parts of Canada for 20 years. If you're out on um, Vancouver Island or in Vancouver itself, there have been dispensaries selling cannabis products to people for a very long time. Is it a cultural reason, do you think, that cannabis has been, sorry, that Canada has been such a front runner when it comes to the cannabis industry? Partially, but actually just use rates alone or... um, popular opinion on cannabis aren't in themselves a good uh, determining factor in whether that country is going to legalise cannabis. There was also a lot of political context to understand. So 
Uh, for one, they'd had a very strong court system which had defended patients' rights to access medical cannabis historically. That's something that we don't have in the UK. At every opportunity UK courts have had, uh, they've denied patients the rights to access cannabis, whereas in, Calif in Canada and in other jurisdictions, uh, there's been a very different trajectory. Then also there's the political situation, which was that Trudeau, when he came to power with the Liberals, um, it was an unexpected win. He He'd put uh, cannabis legalization on his manifesto, uh, partly to extol his, you know, liberal values to win young voters, and because I do think he personally and a lot of his party have supported this cause for quite some time. But it was a shock victory when they came to power. So this wasn't something that many people were expecting, apart from a few Canadian insiders. So can you give us a sense of how difficult and lengthy really that process was before legalisation in October of 2018 for Trudeau? It was a very difficult process. And even though Canada had quite high levels of support, what we see with cannabis around the world as well is that the, the politicians and the establishment and major institutions are much slower to change their attitudes towards cannabis than the public are. We can see that here in the UK, where a far higher percentage of the public support cannabis legalisation than parliamentarians do. And equally, um, the vast majority of the UK public want access to medical cannabis, but the vast majority of doctors are reluctant to prescribe it. So there's a real, you know, disparity. But in, in Canada, that had to all be overcome. So there were the institutions and major establishments. And what Trudeau did was, instead of really talking about, you know, the benefits of cannabis or promoting cannabis as a hobby or as a thing to be consumed, he focused on the arguments that were going to win over people who, who didn't support cannabis legalization, and that was reducing criminality, improving and um, r improving the safety around it, so ensuring that there was no access to children. So he focused religiously just on those two points, on uh, reducing cr criminality and stopping children from having access. And one of the clever things that he did was put Bill Blair, who was Toronto's top cop, in charge of uh, the issue. So he had the top policeman that everybody knew was quite a conservative character saying, this is what I want to do and I want to do it for law and order reasons. So, I mean, when we look further afield beyond Canada's borders, it looks like a lot of other countries are potentially following suit. I mean, we've got this referendum in New Zealand, for example, uh, next year, the UK legalising medical marijuana last year. And it looks as though Luxembourg could be the first European country to legalise the drug as well. I mean, for these countries, what do you think are the key lessons that can be learned from Canada's experience? I think there's there's a number. I, uh, no one's done this perfectly or even necessarily very well yet. Um, one of the issues we've got in Canada at the moment is it's legal and yet the vast majority of cannabis consumers are still buying products through illegal channels. So that's not doing what the policy was there to do, which is to remove the criminality and, you know, also obviously increase tax revenues, which is a benefit for the public. And, you know, there's only five legal shops in Toronto at the moment. That's too slow. This was legalised a long time ago. Um, if the government was had more willing, they could have easily allowed a lot more shops. In places like Alberta in Canada, there's good legal access and we're seeing much higher rates of engagement. But it also comes down to price, comes down to the range of products that are available and just generally out competing the black market. So there's this balance between making it safer and restricting it and restricting marketing and advertising. But if you over focus on that, then people are just going to keep buying cannabis off their dealers because they're going to get a better service and they're going to get a better product and they're going to get it at a better price. I mean, yeah, the price issue is quite interesting because that legal cannabis is considerably higher. And part of that is about the tax. Um, do you think the taxes are too high? Potentially. I think there are lots of jurisdictions where the effective rate of tax is far, far too high. And lots of the US states, because of the problems they've got around federal illegality, the tax rates are very high. I think in reality, in order for this to work well, it start, it, it's best not to try and raise too much tax early, but to focus in the early years on eliminating the black market, and then you can gradually increase tax rates and, and do it at a level that's tolerable. We see this with tobacco. When countries start taxing it 
very excessively, then you see a huge increase in the illicit market and there's a balance to be struck there and no one's going to get it perfect straight away. And what about the regulations around the industry as well? What do you make of those? Well, there are some regulations in Canada that I, I think are just, you know, completely over the top. That, For instance, the packaging of the products. There is a clear reason to package these carefully so uh, children can't access them. However, we sell whiskey by the litre and if you drank all of that you would die and there's no childproof packaging and yet in Canada a very small amount of a flower that it would be pretty much uh, innocuous if a child was to get their hands on it and eat it is in you know something that you would think something <laughs> a gun should be stored in like a huge amount of uh, over packaging has gone into the industry so that's one issue um, also I personally think that the plain packaging is over the top, that it's hard for consumers to actually see what they're buying. But that is a really contentious issue. And I think there are good arguments on both sides. But I happen to think that it's over the top. I mean, on the packaging issue, do you ultimately sort of see this as an industry that could rival the alcohol industry or the tobacco industry? Well, if you look at blended kind of use rates from across most developed nations, there's about 80% of people who consume alcohol and down to about 10 to 15% who consume cannabis. So th that's quite a big disparity. But surely that would change if it became legal. Yes, for certain. I think it's likely that use rates will increase where it's legalized, but people will use it safer uh, in a more safe manner and they'll be using safer products. So there's a benefit there. But I'm not sure if cannabis will ever be as big as alcohol. Tobacco is another matter. You know, in, in developed countries, tobacco use rates is rapidly declining um, and cannabis could, could definitely outcompete tobacco in, in most developed nations. And when we're looking beyond Canada's borders, I mean, where do you see the key growth areas? Where do you think the opportunities are for investment? I think all over the world there, there are opportunities to do this right. Um, people have been putting a lot of money into developing nations like uh, Colombia and uh, countries in Southern Africa, who they see as the real focus for the cultivation for the industry. But that proof of concept hasn't been proven yet. Uh, in most uh, countries, uh, the cannabis that is consumed legally is produced in the country or exported from very few countries, i.e. Canada, the UK and the Netherlands in, in, in particular. So quite how the global supply chain is going to work is again a contentious issue that we don't know but the general trend towards the legalization of cannabis in countries around the world is going to continue and there will be uh, sizable opportunities for investors in countries around the world and very finally would you say that canada's experience so far has been a success yes a very qualified success <laughs> i think I understand politically how they had to go about it. And I think the important thing is that they got the job done. I think a lot of people aren't very understanding of what they had to do in terms of compromise. Um, but there is a very long way to go before this is anywhere near perfect. You know, this really is the beginning. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. Thanks, George. That was George McBride, CEO at Hanway Associates. Let's get on to Bruce Linton now. He's the former CEO at Canopy Growth. Bruce, good to chat to you. Tell us, when did you first get involved in the cannabis industry? What was the opportunity that you saw that others didn't? So in um, 2012, uh, I observed that there was the intent of the, the, the then Conservative government to change the rules under which medical cannabis would be provided. And I say change because Canada began having a medical cannabis regime in 2001, but it was um, it was sort of uh, a distributed. You might grow your own plants or have other people grow them for you. It was kind of uh, hard to regulate. And so what their intent was, as far as I could tell, was to make it so that um, they would centralize growing and production processes and distribution in companies so that they could actually track the quantities and qualities made. And so I began a business about that time thinking about what would that look like? How do you maintain chain of custody, meaning don't lose any? How do you have shipping control so that um, you never ship it to the wrong patient? And uh, by the summer of 2013, the regulations were issued. And uh, I commenced the construction creation of a fairly large, about 450,000 square foot 
building being converted into a cannabis company, which was then called Tweed. So as someone who's been at the helm of one of the biggest listed cannabis companies in Canada, what are your thoughts on the taxes and regulations within the industry? Because one of the criticisms of the legalisation process has been the approach from the government, particularly that it's been arguably a little overly conservative and what that has meant for rising prices for the drug. Yeah, so, um, you know, to sort of square canopy, so if people are looking at trades as uh, CGC on uh, the New York Stock Exchange, which was the first marijuana company traded on the New York Stock Exchange, and it trades in Toronto as weed, and its market cap, um, I believe, has for the last several years made it the largest cannabis company on the planet um, with about $5 billion cash uh, on its balance sheet when I was leaving. Um, so that, that company... Uh, was able to get to this size. Yes, there is some cautious nature to some extent in how the government's doing it, but I would flip it over and say that the Canadian government uh, is doing what most governments will do, all governments will do, because if you don't regulate cannabis, and there need to be some elements of how do you label it and things or how do you tax it, but if they don't regulate it, what they're doing in the U.K., and maybe what they're doing in you know most of the world is for recreational cannabis, adults choosing to buy it, they're ignoring it. And government policy that says we're going to ignore cannabis, essentially in Canada, said that we're going to allow uh, a criminal enterprise to have access to an eight to ten billion dollars Canadian, call it six to seven billion dollars U.S. market, where the government's not going to try to give it a new supply chain. And we know for sure that putting people in jail doesn't work, so they quit doing that. And so the regulatory framework, rather than the ignoring it framework in Canada, does have a very modest tax rate. It is very low. It's about 10% excise tax. And the reason they kept it low is that if they made it extremely high, the criminals would have a material advantage. And then what they did is they got a bit cautious on the labeling, but where Canada is, is now approaching the second generation of its regulations. So in January... You're going to see quite an increase in the types of products, beverages, vapes, edibles, available legally. They're not currently. It's principally dried cannabis and some oils currently. When those come out, uh, those products will be more interesting, a little easier to brand, and it will put pressure on the criminal enterprise because they won't have those products, meaning they don't set up bottling plants and science to make great beverages. And so I think, you know, point in time... Canada's doing a pretty good job. I think we hosted probably 20 or 30 countries, health ministries at Canopy, or uh, delegations from law enforcement or uh, folks who were elected to try and understand how Canada was doing it because it was viewed as the best practice on the planet. So in terms of the outlook for the industry, I mean, at the start of 2018, there were already 12 cannabis companies worth more than a billion dollars, one of which was your own. Tell us about your predictions for the global cannabis industry, say, in the next 10 years. I mean, how big do you see this sector becoming? It it depends how you use your strength. And so what I was trying to do in Canopy was... Yes, we wanted to have quite a a strong representation in uh, the simple production, processing, and sale of the product, but uh, we had over 100 patents issued to the company uh, by the end of July and pursuing many, many more. And the reason that matters is I think the scope and size of a company over the time duration you described is going to depend on having differentiated goods and intellectual property. And there is a rich opportunity, but if your country hasn't begun regulating, your scientists certainly can't develop intellectual property very easily, nor the scale experience of companies. So I think there's going to be two or three very significant companies representing serious uh, medical research, really advanced consumer products, which will turn into desired brands. And I don't think uh, the valuation is particularly high Because I suspect if you dug in and said, what's the total available market? What's the TAM for cannabis? I'm going to use $500 annually U.S. And that's both the illicit market, but the advanced applications that currently aren't routine. Meaning, if we can generate therapeutic responses for geriatric people, meaning you're in your grandparents or your mom and dad or in a care or assisted living, and you start reducing the pharmaceutical products they take because they're anxious, uh, 
or don't sleep well, have limited mobility, some pain, diminished appetite. If we can do all that with cannabis, that's a humongous market that I don't think people calculate, and that's just one piece, and there's all kinds of animal care. So I think if you have a 500 annual TAM, you're going to have some really serious companies. Do you think it's an industry that can Sorry. ultimately rival, say, the alcohol industry? Why? Well, I think parts of it, yes. Um, so if you came to my house and I was serving a terrific cut of beef, mm-hmm. I'm going to try and make sure I have the exact right red wine to go with that. But if you're coming over and I'm making you a cocktail, I'm not sure why you wouldn't want a tweed and tonic, which would be about two to two and a half milligrams of THC in a clear, slightly uh, sparkling bubbled, nicely flavored (laughs) beverage that makes you feel a bit upbeat. But the best part is it's non-dehydrating, so you're not going to find yourself with a hangover. And it has zero calories, so you can actually say that you're not getting fatter while having fun. I guess you've got to be careful about the munchies, though. Well, it's funny. <laughs> There's some strains that generate that, but that kind of goes back to the first one, right? If mom and dad or grandma and grandpa aren't eating well, you want to find how come people get the munchies. Because if you think about it, if you're feeling terrible, suppose someone you know is going through an oncology treatment, they are not hungry. They feel nauseous. So we know scientifically, as a medical group, how to make people not nauseous. But making people have the munchies, having them become hungry, that's a pretty unbelievable achievement, and cannabis can do it all day long. All right, now I wanted to talk a bit about canopy growth in some more details. Obviously, you were the CEO of the first cannabis producer to list on the New York Stock Exchange. It became the first publicly traded cannabis company in North America back in 2014, and it was the first cannabis unicorn company, meaning it has a valuation of more than a billion dollars. So, Bruce, tell us what was that like? What was the opportunity that you saw that others didn't? My motive for going on those exchanges was not initially or really ever access to capital, which sounds like a pretty unreasonable thing to say when you're going on exchanges. But what it was really about was um, enhancing the credibility of the company and the sector. And um, so when I listed first uh, in Toronto and then moved up through all the different rankings of the exchanges, it was so that earned media would cover us, you know, the newspapers and TV and talk about us and show that we're real and legitimate, and Deloitte was our auditor at the time, so that people would have a bit more confidence to ask their doctor about it. And then the New York Stock Exchange was so that when uh, we had opened up by the time I left in July in about 16 countries, and when you're interacting with the leadership entities in a country who are trying to figure out how to regulate and who do they trust, what you want to talk about is the New York Stock Exchange. You want to talk about your auditors, and you want to talk about the big investors. And then, you know, when you get to what you actually do, you you don't put that on the table too boldly because people are initially a bit cautious. And so really what what it was about was boring other people's credibility to succeed. Now, Canopy Growth also became the first cannabis company to export dried cannabis to Germany to be sold through pharmacies. And it was the first to strike a relationship with a Fortune 500 beverage alcohol supplier. So in terms of the future of these companies, I mean, what are some of the new products that you think we'll start to see? Well, I think you're going to start to see by the end of the year and into Q1, some of the clinical trials that Canopy and others are doing. Uh, doing what they call read data, essentially saying what the results are. And if the results of sleep trials or some of the things they described in animal activities show a positive response against target indications, then you're going to start to see that becoming challenging and interesting for pharma players, and they're going to have to talk with them. I think you're going to see new technologies coming out of companies that are advanced um, related to the vaporization, so there's not some of the Included ingredients that are the big talk right now, but rather make it a medical thoughtful process. And I think beverages are going to be immense and big and important as a way to deliver cannabis. Because an awful lot of people would like the effect of cannabis without the smell and the stigma and the smoke. And I've been to the UK enough times to know that occasionally some people in the UK enjoy having a social occasion with a beverage or two. Um, <laughs> That would be a perfect platform in which to introduce a range of cannabis beverages that are effective, similar, 
an onset to alcohol, but um, I continue to think about the zero calories as a compelling driver. Now, I wanted to talk about the financials of these companies a little bit, because, I mean, say if we take canopy growth, it tends to burn through a lot of cash and profitability isn't necessarily the key driver. I mean, when do companies such as Canopy start to prioritise um, profitability over growth? When's the time? Um, well, I think we could have been profitable um, probably three years ago. But um, I don't. I think what you want to do is have a profitable country like Canada when you normalize the way you report, which uh, we have given indication should be in the next 12 months or less. But then continue to pile money into creating the necessary infrastructure and science to be globally dominant. Because if you focus on profitability now, what you're focusing on is they're also decelerating growth on a global basis because growth is not free. You do not get to export everything. You get occasionally to export. What we have to usually have is assets and infrastructure in each country or region and a whole lot of science work so you have a defensible future. And so I think, you know, um, the companies should show what their actual margin model is and their profits in a single country that's advanced, which the only one on the planet right now is Canada. But after that, plow as much in as they can to being you know, the company people talk about for 100 years. So lastly, I just wanted to ask you a bit about what happened when you left in the summer. You told CNBC that you were essentially terminated. So what happened there and what are you planning next? What happened is very large companies, doesn't matter if they're tobacco, pharmacy, uh, alcohol, tend to have very solid profit margins and very limited growth. And their shareholders buy their stock because each 90 days they should generate a little bit more earnings per share, meaning squeeze a little bit more out. And high growth companies that are like tech companies or Canopy are not reporting earnings per share and kind of don't care now. What they care about is adjusted EBITDA. And what that means is that we back out stuff like stock-based compensation and we don't even think about those non-cash affecting things because we're not reporting earnings per share. And when Canopy looks at things as a growth company or Google, if you have to build a building so you can do what you want, so you can host your servers as Google or your cannabis as Canopy, you don't mind building it because that's why you raise money. But if you're an earnings per share company, you like to lease things so you don't have a uh, you know, balance sheet head. And so those are the differences. And I would say that you know, I was at the front line of one type of thinking, and uh, that type of thinking wasn't necessarily as good a fit once we have a lot of money in from an earnings per share company. And very finally, for other countries looking towards Canada, I mean, what are the key lessons that can be learnt? And would you describe the Canada experience so far as a success? Yeah, so it is a success in that um, it's generating major companies which are leaders on their planet and it's giving criminal delivery systems pressure that's only increasing. It means that the government's collecting taxes and they now have an obligation to educate people about cannabis because they can't say they're ignoring it. Um, I think there are 30 to 50 countries on the planet right now pursuing some form of regulatory framework often very similar. And it's because Canada is a pretty straight-laced, boring kind of place. <laughs> and the fact that it did it first, and as far as I can tell, most people are still going to work and things like that, it's a very good shield for every other country to say they're contemplating it. Now, that's it for today's episode of IG's Trading the Markets. We've been speaking to George McBride, CEO of Hanway Associates, along with Bruce Linton, former CEO at Canopy Growth. And remember to subscribe to our podcast to learn more about investing in cannabis.